There is a reason why this island is on so many bucket lists. The landscape. The wildlife. It's history. My girlfriend and I have traveled over 2,000 kilometers in some of the worst conditions possible just to get here. And today, we're gonna show you it from start to finish. From the epic four-wheel driving. To the picturesque landscapes. We explore the history of Fraser Island and get a glimpse of its future. We chase the tides. We run from storms. We break down. That's what we did. We are forced to make hard decisions. There are so many reasons why this location is on people's bucket lists. And by the end of this video, hopefully, it's on yours too. This is our Fraser Island trip. Yeah, well, we're on Fraser, and um, I don't really need to air down just yet, but I figured uh, I'm bringing them down to 20 psi. We're going to do a lot of inland tracks today, so they don't need to be on anything crazy low. Uh, especially with all the rain we've had, I reckon all the sand's going to be quite hard. All right, so we're on Fraser Island. Um, so they've had so much rain over here in the last couple of days, or last week really. This is more reminiscent of Talanki rather than... Fraser Island, like there's just massive bog holes everywhere because it's had so much rain. Honestly, I couldn't care about the mud. I was just glad it wasn't raining. We had a big day planned ahead of us, so we hit the tracks and started exploring Fraser Island. Since the weather was really good, we decided to head towards the inland lakes with the first stop being Lake Birrabeen. Oh wow. Perched on top of a sand dune, Birrabeen is pure rainwater, making it some of the clearest water you'll see. Now this place is insane. Like the sand is so white, the water is crystal clear. What a day and this place is like empty. Like it's just insane. It's clear to say the Birrabeen had us hyped for Lake Mackenzie. So we go back in the car, track back north towards the iconic Lake Mackenzie. <laughs> it looks so blue. Like, it's just insane. This is absolute paradise. Like, genuinely. <laughs> Like I knew it was good. I knew I knew this place was gonna and be we good. Saw fish. Mm -hmm. we saw fish. I knew like McKenzie would be good, but it's just that good. And if you get a good day for it, like, oh, it's absolutely unreal. You should show how white this sand is. You'll like, ever literally see. Literally, Patrick coloured sand. <laughs> I know. It's, I could, as we said, we spent we've been here for probably like we spent a whole afternoon here, and I wouldn't have it any other way. It's just apps looking out, you know, to the bush, the hills, so green. We Alright, so we've had a great day today. It's been amazing. So tonight... Fraser Island's just been... Just... It's just been an absolute dream. It has. Uh, tonight, we're at Central Station, which is a pretty central sort of campground in the sort of... <laughs> really? <laughs> central Station is located um, on the southern end of the island, near all the lakes, so it's super easy to get to like Lake Mackenzie and Barrabee and all that. So. We're staying here tonight for one night, and um, yeah, it's a really nice rainforesty atmosphere. Well, tomorrow morning we'll go and check out the like the freshwater little creek there and everything. And I'll tell you what, oh. this place is literally empty. Like, there's only three people here. There's three cars in the entire campsite. So like, 
when I was booking everything, like, the spots were filling up like crazy, so I guess a lot of people just, like, can cancelled their holiday and just didn't show up, which is campsite's massive, by the way. Like, there's got toilets here, showers here, everything. So, yeah, awesome little spot. We'll get some dinner going, and, um, yeah, get on to tomorrow. We should do that. After packing up, we were really keen to check out Central Station, and I think this is a great time to tell you guys some of the history about Fraser Island. Fraser Island, or as the Aboriginals called it, Kigari, meaning paradise, is estimated to be millions of years old. Moulded by years of wind, ocean currents and waves, it's the largest sand island on the planet. And you might think, how does an island made of sand have an abundance of rainforest and eucalyptic woodlands? Well, unlike many sand islands, plant life is abundant due to the naturally occurring fungi present in the sand. This releases nutrients in a form that can be absorbed by the plants. Early impressions of the island were not positive. Matthew Flinders, the first English explorer to set foot on Fraser Island in 1802, noted, Nothing can be imagined more barren than this peninsula. However, eventually, settlers began grazing cattle in the 1840s, and by the 1860s, logging of valuable curry pines began. And this is what Central Station was, a small logging camp that over time grew into a small township. The logging industry thrived on the island for over a century and only ended as recently as the 1990s when Fraser Island was officially listed as a World Heritage Area. We then made our way across the Yurong and went to the bakery. Alright, so we just had a pie, uh, and you got a coffee from Yurong. Really good pies by the way. And, and the people at the bakery were really nice. Really nice people at the bakery and they were yeah. affordable. Like I paid more for pies back on the mainland. Like well, Mount Kosciuszko. There were six bucks for the pies. I thought that was pretty, that wasn't too bad considering we're on an island. So now we're heading down onto the beach the first time ever. My first ever beach drive. Um, I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. The weather has absolutely turned it on. It's beautiful. And um, yeah, we're going to go on the beach and go for a drive. I'm just so keen. So we'll jump on and yeah, let's go. Oh, Dingo! Where? Are you serious? Hello, buddy. What class is We just saw our first dingo. First dingo seen. Alright, let's get on to the beach. Here we go, beach driving. Oh, oh. Mate, it's like a highway out here. <laughs> this is awesome. This is unreal. Let's drive it along the beach. beach is just the coolest thing ever. I've just never experienced anything like it. The sound, the views, it's like you're doing a beach walk but you're in your car. It's just one of the coolest places I've ever taken my four-wheel drive. How was that? Oh, it's unreal. It's just nothing like it. I, I don't know. It's just like something different about driving on the beach. It's just like, yeah, it's, it's insane. Yeah. Insane. I love it. I can't wait. Let's do more. Let's do more. Let's get the car. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. After travelling further north at the beach, we turned off onto the inland tracks towards a lake that in the future might not be there anymore. Lake Wobby was slowly formed over time as a once coastal creek was blocked by the sand blown from the easterly winds. It is located directly next to the Hammerstone sand blow, which will eventually engulf the lake. But right now, it's still a great place to swim. After Lake Wobby, we got back on the beach and headed north towards the iconic Eli Creek. Eli Creek has said to have been some of the purest water in the world. From its beginnings up at the sand dunes, the water can take around a hundred years to filter through into the ocean. The creek deposits over 4 million litres of water every hour into the sea. And it is home to various forms of wildlife such as eels, fish, birds and even turtles. The dingoes also seem to love this place. So tonight we're camping uh, at Camping Zone 5, Mahino, um, which is you're just north of Eli Creek, just south of the Mahino. Um, it's only a couple K stretch of campsites, but yeah, we've got some nice food ones here. A park is just um, on the other side of the dune, 
Just kind of away from the wind because there is a bit of an easterly at the moment. It is awesome to be camping on Fraser. Unreal. So we kicked back and got ready for a night along the beach. So I can see why so many Queenslanders love beach camping. Like, oh, it's insane. I, yeah, I can see why so many people say, go to Fraser or head north Queensland or, you know, all that. It's just it's insane. Like, up here in May, in singlets, you know, so different than from Melbourne. I love Victoria and I think it is one of the best places to get a well-rounded mix of stuff that, um, yeah, I can see why, you know, Queenslanders love their beaches because this stuff is just unreal. So now I'm going to sit down and enjoy it. Things didn't get any better. We are literally witnessing a moonrise. I've never watched a moonrise before, Anya. This is unreal. We sat back, watched the moon come up, and soaked it all in. This place is special. So for tonight's dinner, we have been using a bit of power. Um, we're actually using the Travel Buddy to cook up some wedges. So that's been going for the past hour, pulling somewhere between five and six amps. I've also had the laptop going. I've been just transferring files, doing a bit of editing, stuff like that. Yeah, I've been pulling roughly about 10 amps from the battery now for the past hour and a half. Um, and yeah, voltage holding up great. Everything holding up great. System's working brilliantly. Mate, look at that. You are All good. Brilliant. Last time we made, made we made wedges. They weren't crunchy. You saw it took us nearly three hours, and they still weren't good. These, in there for about an hour, they're way better. What? What? Did you change them? <gasps> that marinade is so good, Anya. Holy crap! Mm. Got a dingo at camp. Nah, he's all good. He's just he just he's he's just looking for food. We woke up this morning to some great weather, so we took the opportunity to quickly head back down to Eli Creek, have a quick float, and then we jumped on the beach heading northbound towards the Mahino shipwreck. The SS Mahino was first an ocean liner, doing crossings between New Zealand and Australia. But during World War I, it was commissioned as a hospital ship, where it would serve off Anzac Cove, loading casualties from the war in Gallipoli. At the end of the war, in 1918, Mahino was released from military service and resumed its commercial life. In 1935, it finally retired work and was sold to Japan for scrap. And well, it didn't make it to Japan. During a cyclone, its tow rope snapped and it drifted off course and landed here, where over the years, it's been slowly washing away. We then checked out the Spectacular Pinnacles, which is an ancient formation of minerals and sand, before turning inland to the west coast of Fraser Island. All right, so we're on the way to Awinya Creek um, via Worley Creek Road. A few people bogged up ahead. It is a bit of, a, it's pretty soft sand, um, but it's like a Hyundai Tucan SUV thing that's bogged, so I think we'll be no dramas. Um, but they're just getting pulled out now, and then hopefully, low range, third gear, and power through, and I think we'll be fine. Um, but yeah. But then, as we went to start the car, my biggest nightmare striked. How? Why? It's fully dead. It's got no power. It's got nothing. Hopefully it's something easy under the dash. On first inspection, everything looked fine, so it was time to pull out the tools, dig through some wires, and find out why there wasn't any power getting from the battery to the car. At this point, I was thinking of everything I've done to the car, the central locking, all the wiring I've touched, anything that could have been stopping the car from running. And because we were stuck in the middle of the track, I pretty much had to put the camera down and just figure this out as fast as I could. Luckily, we managed to get it working, and I'll tell you what went wrong once we arrive at camp. Well, we got a bit of water to go through. Traveling alone and being so far away from home definitely makes you a bit more cautious before you just plow into things. You have to be self-reliant on you and your vehicle alone, so it definitely makes you think twice before you do little things like this. Uh, 
After making it through the creek crossing, we continued west along Worley Creek Road all the way to the west coast of Fraser Island. All right, so here we are arriving on the west coast of Fraser. Oh, wow. Oh, it is softer, hang on. Let's get in there. Look how, like, um, calm it is. Whoa, way, way, way. All right, well, here we are. West coast of Fraser. All right, immediately, it is a lot softer. Um, you can tell that. It's a lot bumpy up and down as well. So we're just bashing up here probably like a four or five k's up to Awinia Creek where we're gonna be camping tonight. I was told on the internet that um, Awinia Creek track, which is what we were gonna come into if we're inland, it just takes a while and it wasn't in good condition at the moment. So we decided to come down here and do the coastal run up, which you do have to get the tides right because as you can see the tide goes basically right up to um, that bit of sand there. So the tide does come up, so you just gotta watch that. But Look how beautiful it is! Like it's insane. I can kind of, like it's it's so calm on this side. It's crazy. Palm tree. Palm tree. Just where's our camping spot? How far away? Ah, uh, probably two k's. You definitely want to have your wits about you on the west side of the island. It's a lot quieter and you don't see as many people, and it's also a lot softer and very tidal. So you want to ensure you get the tides right. This is insane. Oh my god, Patty. <laughs> That was close. You gotta really look out for that sort of stuff. And with the lack of tire tracks, it's sometimes a little hard to work out which way is the right way, especially if you're not that sound experienced like me. So once we arrived at Awinia Creek, we pulled up to an absolute gun camp spot looking over the ocean on pristine white sand. All right, well, we made it to Awinia Creek, um, which is great. And we pulled up to a campsite to try it. Um, but then when I shut the car off, the car wouldn't start again. So I'll show you what's happening, what the issue is. Essentially, there's a feasible link here, um, which then goes down to the main loom. Let me show you. Do you want to show me another? Oh. So here down here is the fusible link and as you can see it's connected up to the battery here So basically these two wires are just broken. They're just very frail and old. So I'm trying to fix them So we can keep driving and not break down all the time The good thing about this car is that you know even if this disconnects the car will still drive But yeah, as soon as you shut the car off you need to obviously restart from the battery. So um, Yeah, you need that connected. So um, Yeah, I'll get soldering and fix them <laughs> We made ourselves some lunch and plan to just relax here in the afternoon. Right. Patty in paradise. It is paradise here. At Awinia Creek, um, we've set up a wonderful campsite. I've set up the hammock finally. We're here for two nights, so we're just gonna basically just relax, have, have a great time here, have a fish, we brought the surf rod. Oh yeah, just enjoy it. Like, I just, it's, it's actual paradise. I know I've said this probably like 20 times on this trip, but like, Every new place on the island just surprised me. It's like, I was like, I can't beat that, and then it does beat it. Like, this place is just insane. It's only, they only allow 20 people up to Winnie Creek, I think 20 or 30 um, per night. There's absolutely no one here. There's probably about 10 people in this entire camp zone. It's just absolute paradise. Collecting water because Patrick won't let me use the jerry cans. We gotta preserve said, water. We only have. He said, you have to drink creek water. <laughs> no, we just. <laughs> And with the Winyard Creek, you actually have a freshwater creek just behind the campsite. So um, if you do want to swim or whatever, you can. Go get a photo of that, that's funny as. Hang on. Tonight's dinner, courtesy of the Travel Buddy. Um, we are having Asian delights. We've had spring rolls, 
What are these triangle things called? Um, samosas. Samosas. Um, all <laughs> cooked in the travel, buddy. We've been looking at the beach. We saw three sea turtles. Um, we saw a bunch of fish jumping. Absolutely insane, like the wildlife, even at night time. Oh no, they're just like with their massive lumpy heads bobbing out of the water. Mm. So cool. Dingo's been obviously smelling our food cooking, have mum circling around. It's been an absolutely beautiful night. Not a like not a breath of wind and just been yeah, super super nice. Zola. So this morning we woke up uh, and everything was dead and everything was looking in a very bad state. The awning was collapsed, um, there was rain everywhere. Basically a storm came through last night um, at around what, 10, 11 o'clock and just held it down for like 15 minutes and just like soaked everything. But what was worse is when we woke up was that the power was all dead. The battery was dead, the fridge was off, everything was off. So um, had to quickly start the car, um, just charge it up for half an hour. And now that the sun is slowly coming out, we've got our solar panels out. Um, so hopefully we can, um, yeah, get enough power uh, today. But apart from that, we're out of Winnie Creek. Um, we're gonna have a grouse day here on the beach. It's absolutely beautiful. Put up the chairs, sit in the hammock, make an awesome egg and bacon breakfast. On butane, of course. None of this electrical stuff, don't have the power for it. Um, but yeah, just enjoy the day. So let's get into it. Hey, dance. Oh, worms. <laughs> so we got the solar blanket out, we got the panel on top of the rooftop tent and we're pulling about eight and a half amps combined. So that's really good. I think the reason that the battery sort of went dead this morning was because of we didn't do a lot of driving yesterday and for a lot of the time we were driving there was actually no, the car wasn't connected to the battery. The main, uh, you know, power connector wire had torn. So um, it wasn't getting a full charge. So it was literally just getting solar yesterday. So. It's doing pretty well considering the amount of power I have been using recently. Um, and the fridge is working a bit harder being up, you know, Queensland. We've got one size has a freezer and one size has a fridge. And um, that's drawing roughly around two and a half amps. And that'll turn on every, you know, couple minutes or so and just keep it cooled down. But um, yeah, brilliant setup. It's just working smicko. And the best thing about a Winyah Creek is that you have a fresh water source literally just over there, just behind uh, the beach here. So you've got salt water on that side fresh water on that side so for all our dishes and stuff we've just been going down collecting a bucket of fresh water then we can do our dishes you could even nearly use this to boil to drink if you boiled it um but yeah it's just awesome having fresh water next to a beach and i've absolutely loved having a dual zone fridge like i never really thought much about having a freezer when camping until we got one and now that we can freeze stuff like we've been able to eat that much better We've been using, having a bunch of, you know, frozen veggies and stuff, frozen fruit, everything that, when you're going on a trip for, you know, longer than a week or so, um, fresh food just doesn't keep the same. Like, you know, for lettuce leaves and all that, it'll start browning off. So it's good to be able to have frozen fruit and veggies to still eat nice, but um, to also just have it keep longer. And on the whole 95 litre thing, Originally, I thought this fridge was way too big for me. Like, I thought I'd never actually use up all that space. But I can say for certain, for two people, for this, this, this week trip long on Fraser, we have filled this fridge to the brim. We probably had a little bit of extra room in the freezer, but the fridge itself is chockers. And when, when you have that sort of fridge space, you can afford to have a lot more, you know, luxury foods in there, or stuff that takes up a lot of room. You can fit a lot more beers in and all that. So it's absolutely fantastic just having the bigger fridge. After using like a big dual zone fridge, I don't think I could ever go back to a single zone. Just having that freezer for those longer trips makes an absolute difference. All right, so tonight's our last night out of Winya Creek. It's been great today, just been fishing, swimming, doing all that, so it's been a great time just to be able to chill out and not have to go anywhere. So um, yeah, it's been really good, but tomorrow is gonna be um, a big day. We're going back east and we're actually going to Sandy Cape, which is the northern point of the island. So. We're gonna do, there's probably a Winyah Creek track tomorrow um, across the Winyah Creek itself, uh, which is gonna be hard because tomorrow's looking like high tide, they're gonna be at 10 a.m. So we're probably gonna be crossing it when it's fairly deep. Um, and then yeah, basically push inland and then all the way up past the Gala Rocks. Um, and then yeah, to the uh, Sandy Point and hopefully yeah, get a spot up there. It's been looking like it's gonna turn bad all day, but it's actually still been really good. So been just hanging out in the hammock, eating things and having fun and fishing. and. Been a great day, been a really good day, and I highly recommend if you are coming up to Owinia Creek, book at least two nights, maybe even more. We, would, we probably could have done another night here, so um, yeah, definitely don't just book one night, book two or three, because um, it's absolutely just gorgeous. It's, it's a really awesome place to go. So anyway, without further ado, 
we're gonna go for a walk and um, yeah we'll, we'll pick up the camera again tomorrow morning when we're heading to Sandy Cape. Successful river crossing and a bunch of dingoes howling. How cool! We probably could have done that a bit later, but uh, it's good to get across anyway. And I walked through that at high tide, it was my waist, so it does get pretty deep. So from Winyard Creek, we're heading to the Eastern Beach across all these beautiful inland tracks. Some of it's low range, but it's it's all pretty pretty chill. But the scenery out here is just insane. Like you go from the beaches into like these massive sort of savanna and wetland areas, and it's just unreal. I've said unreal like 20 times. It's true, haven't it? Once we got back onto the main track, we fired up the inverter and made some breakfast. With the toasties made, we headed back east and across the bog. So we just turned off the main drag up here to go up a little track to Lake Alom. Now, I didn't, even, I didn't even know this place existed. Like, after all my research about Fraser, I never heard of this place. And it's absolutely insane. Like, you can just do this little walk down here and see tens and tens of turtles. We probably saw like 40 turtles all up. Just little ones hanging down there and swimming around, floating around. They're very friendly. You can literally sit down next to the lake on this bench and they swim up to you and put their heads out of the water and float around. And, Oh, it's just magical. So if you're coming through Fraser and you're going out to the west side to like a Winyard Creek or something, stop in at Lake Alum. You have to. The turtles there are insane. After getting back on the track, we popped out on the east coast and then headed north. All right, so we're coming up to the Indian Head Bypass, um, which is notorious for being a bit soft. Um, and you're meant to get a bit of a run-up for it. It is high tide, so we're going to have less of a run-up, but we'll just put it, you know, probably might even go low range. Let's see how we go. Alright, here it is. Second high. Let's get into it. Oh, I probably need a more speed here. Oh. oh my god. That was. Oh god. We're going. We're doing it. Oh, that's not even that bad. Yeah, that's fine. I thought that might be bad, but. 83. <laughs> After completing the bypass track, we popped out on the north side of Indian Head, got back on the beach and started heading north. Danger. Oh, a bit softer here. I mean, obviously when it's low tide, you'll be driving down there, so it's like you, you can, you're getting good fuel economy, you, the car has to work a lot less, but when it is high tide, you're getting pushed up onto the softer stuff, so you just work a bit harder to sort of get everywhere, but it's not too bad. After completing the bypass track, we checked out the iconic champagne pools, but the weather was a bit wild today, so we didn't actually go in the water, but it was cool to check them out anyway. We then visited the least glamorous part of the island at the Orchid Beach Dump Point, which was the smelliest place we've ever been to. But it is great having somewhere to put your rubbish if you're up there for multiple days. <gasps> oh. oh, I can't breathe so bad to tell you. After dumping our rubbish, we got back on the beach and headed towards Sandy Cape but there was one thing in our path. All right, so we're here, the Gala Rock. There's no one else actually here, which is kind of surprising. So um, we have it, ourselves, have it all to ourselves to do. So I've um, already walked the entire track. It is bloody soft. It's definitely the softest sand seen on Fraser yet. I think the 80 would be fine. I'm just gonna low range, third gear or second gear and just plant it and I uh, reckon we'll be able to get through. Worst case, shove ourselves out. We're not in any tidal waters or anything, so it shouldn't be too bad. Gala Rocks, never thought I'd be doing this. Here we go. It's weird, you see it on like on YouTube so often and then actually be there in real life. It's just like, whoa, I'm here. It's actually happening. Maybe we do some low range. <laughs> just gotta make sure that hit anything. It's um it's actually really kind of tight going through. Tighter than what it looks. 
on YouTube. Getting there, first bit done. I'm trying to give it the berries. So I'm just been uh, looking down the beach and um, we're still like two or three hours off low tide. Uh, maybe even more, maybe four hours off low tide actually. So we're probably gonna chill around Nagala Rocks for a bit, have some lunch only because right now, like on low tide you can drive around all these rocks, but otherwise we'd have to drive over them all, which I mean, this car will probably do, but... I don't know, so a few people that come the other way, they turned around, didn't even bother doing it because they said, uh, wait until low tide comes. So I'm like, yeah, probably not a, not a, not a bad choice. So I decided to give the rocks a try, so we started going up and down the beach, dodging rocks, trying to avoid salt water to get as far north as we possibly could. But I wasn't too much further until we ran into some trouble. Basically what's happened is, usually you can just go across the rocks on high tide, but because we had that, you know, freak 200 mil of rain, there's no sand left in the rocks whatsoever. So there's just these massive, you know, holes. Ideally, you want to be just avoiding all these rocks and driving on the complete outside. Once you pass the rocks, it's all guns blazing to the Sandy Cape, but it's just getting through there is a bit how you're going. I know it doesn't look like much on camera, but it's like a minefield. So the other solution is to wait till the tide's low enough and try and get around the outside of the rocks, but you don't have a huge window to do that. My main concern after that is we're only up the Sandy Cape for one night, the day after that, the tide, um, the low tide is even higher. So it's not, it doesn't go as low the next day. So if it's, it was, if it's hard to get around today, it's gonna be even harder to get around tomorrow. I thought we'd be seeing way more traffic coming up Sandy Cape, but we've seen literally no one doing it. Everyone's turned around. So I don't know if that means I shouldn't. Just... <sighs> it probably could do it. Like it probably could do it. And I guess it's me just being a bit of a wimp, not wanting to push my car through it. Like not- No, no not- Take that back. <laughs> Nah, well, it's, I don't know. It's just like, if the tire's not on our side and the track's not in good condition, then maybe it's not a smart thing to do it. I don't know. What we're gonna do, we're gonna sit around, we'll eat some pies. I will think about it in my head, <laughs> make my decision whether I wanna push it or not. Because once you get past these 500 meters of rocks, we're straight through to Sandy Cape. Smooth sailing. See? Oh, it's pie time. Pie time. So we sat in the car and ate our pies and eventually we saw someone coming down from Sandy Cape across the rocks. It definitely looked like a slow process getting over them. So I waved him down just to have a chat and basically concluded that yes, it is doable, but you had to have your wits about you. So we checked the forecast, had a discussion, basically came to the conclusion that one, the tires aren't on our side, the weather wasn't gonna be on our side either. And my confidence in, you know, getting there and still having it be fun and an exciting trip and not just worrying the entire time, we realized it wasn't worth it. I'm not willing to risk it with the tides. I'm not experienced enough as a beach driver. I'm just not. The, the odds don't add up. If it had been like a 12 p.m. low tide tomorrow, boom, that was fine. Daylight, plenty of light to sort it out. But if it's 4, like 4.45 p.m. low tide, it's gonna be pitch black. There's probably gonna be no one else going through. And if we get stuck, we're not gonna have anyone to probably help us, so. Is uh, Nagala Rocks clear? I'm coming from northbound. It's good to do a radio check just to see if anyone is using Channel 15 to, you know, do it because you wouldn't want to go head on into someone. You just would, like... Alright, you ready? <laughs> yep. I'm going to probably do low range... 
second, I reckon. Oh, I probably should have done third, oh well. So we made it back through Nagala Rocks and started heading back south towards Waddy Point where we decided to camp tonight. Yep, that's a, that's an 80 series right there. So Patrick's gonna tell me a story. I'm gonna tell you guys a story. No, <laughs> it look, sounds I, like a trauma story. I feel like this, this this relates to into why I'm worried around oceans. Because like You're telling me, not the camera. I'm telling you. So when we were kids, like I don't know, we were young, like eight till I was like probably eight or something. Liam was probably like six or five or something like that. And um, we were out. Uh, this is with our old GQ patrol. Yeah. Uh, as a family. Is this the one so that all got five stolen? Of us in the car. Yeah, this is the one that got stolen. Yeah. Um, so we were, we were out in uh, South Australia, road to Beachport, uh, doing that whole yeah, road to Beachport beach driving trip. Um, and it was all going sweet. We were doing all the beaches, and I mean, I was already nervous. We were driving on the beach because I was like, as a kid, like mm. worried about getting stuck. Like, oh, what if we get stuck and lose the car? We were on the last little bit of the last beach, and it was called like Little Dip Beach or whatever, Little Dip National Park or something like that, in Robe. And um, we remember we pulling out here, and it, it was like blowing a gale. It was like I think it might even be raining. I don't know. Anyway, we start trucking out. And um, we're going, we're going, and then the car just like starts bogging and bogging and bogs down like midway across this beach. Mm -hmm. And the beach is an angle like 45, it's like a really steep beach. And like we're going in and we're just getting like close doors of water and just like sinking in. Anyway, the car gets like bogged hard and um, I remember there being panic. <laughs> there was panic. I think everyone in the car was panicking because the tide was coming in um, and we were bogged there for a while and like mum was trying to get phone service anyway eventually we somehow got a hold of the caravan park we were staying at and like someone like the, the manager they came out and rescued us whatever but yeah it was just like i don't know ptsd of driving on the beach and like getting stuck <laughs> i just like i don't know i just i think about it sometimes when i'm like on the beach out there like oh what if we just you know stuffs up and you know and then at the same time i think to myself like look it's not a big deal you're not gonna you're not gonna as long as you're not you're only you're outside the vehicle you know, we might lose possessions, but we're going to be fine, you know? Yeah, it'd just be kind of crappy. Yeah, it just be, it yeah. just sucks. And I, cause I don't even know if my insurance will cover that. So I'm thinking about like all the stuff, stuff I've done in this car. I'm like, if I get it stuck, will you know, will RACV actually cover me for any of it? Like I'm, there's 10 million things going through my mind. And then I've got like the camera in my mind thinking, oh, everyone's going to think, you know, I've wimped out and not going to Sandy Cat. There's like a million things going on. And it's just like, I don't know, it's sometimes just, Hard. It's different when you like driving four-wheel tracks that not have title because you're like, oh, if I get bogged here, worst case, I'll, I'll hike out to a hill, get reception, and, and like someone can come and help me. But when you're dealing with tidal stuff, like if your car's below the high tide mark and the tide comes in, it's going to just toss it around like a washing machine and spit it back out and you'll never be able to use it again. And it's just like, I don't know. Not that I'm attached to the car or anything. It's just like, I don't know. It's just like we're so far away from home. I'm not, well, I am attached. But no, I'm attached to tidal. It's just like, I don't know. It just... Anyway, that's my story. Oh, oh my god, these things are long. I don't need one, Nanny. You, 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 you No, I don't. We walked down to the beach and reflected upon the day it was and watched the sun go down. Alright, so that was Waddy Point. Um, Waddy Point is really good if you want sort of a refresh, like a freshen up, because there's great facilities there. There's hot showers, um, they cost two bucks, but they're really good. Um, there's flushing toilets, all that. So if you've got a family or you just want to like get refreshed the next part of your trip, um, Waddy Point is a really good spot. Heaps of bugs there and heaps of cane toads. But if you can deal with that, um, there's good facilities there. We then began tracking southwards and noticed there was a lot of traffic coming the other way. At this point I thought maybe just because it was a Friday it was getting busy, but later did I realise there's actually an annual four-wheel drive cleanup being held that weekend that was operated and ran by a bunch of different four-wheel drive clubs. That's a big van's coming, eh? Hey? As we pushed south through the Indian Head Bypass track, the tide was coming up fast. Ooh. Oh god, that was close. Today's plan was to catch the barge at Inskip Point, but with the weather turning bad and the tide coming up, we had to rush to get there.
We soon realised the tides would now also dictate the rest of the trip down south of the island. Mm. With not much other choice, I decided to gun it. thing that happens on Fraser every year so especially with the weird weather we've had lately the amount of rubbish on the beach has been insane so yeah it's good to see everyone coming up and yeah the huge crowds coming up this weekend to clean the beach which is awesome the weather hasn't turned it on but um it's good to see the crowds anyway that's right I'd rather be wet on Fraser than wet back home so <laughs> yeah, get it. into it yeah so we've got the 80 next to the, next to the big 80 there and oh look it looks a little small <laughs> that doesn't hold up too bad like I thought I'd be real tiny but um it's not bad I like it in person. Yeah, well, since yours in person. I mean, that makes mine look a little bit, you know, <laughs> but, but um, you know, what you dream for. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Nah, see, it was good to see it in yeah, person. Yeah, likewise, man. Watching it online and yeah, <laughs> nah, it was, it was good. good. Good to see the rig in, in, in the flesh. Yeah. It was definitely a great excuse to have a peek under Sam's car and get some ideas of what I could do on my 80 in the future. It was great to catch up with the boys in person and I wish we could have hung around for the cleanup that weekend. But unfortunately, we had commitments back at home, so we had to make a move. All right, we made it to uh, Yurong Bakery finally. And we're gonna have pies. It was um, it was a battle against the tide, uh, but we didn't really get any salt water on the car, which is good. But it was <laughs> maybe one point slightly that we had to gun it, otherwise we were waiting there for a while. But the rest, the rest of it was good. So um, yeah, Yurong now we'll have a pie here, chill out, wait for the tide to go out a little bit because um, yeah, we got to keep driving probably 20k south to um, Hook Point where we catch the barge to Inskip. So yeah. By this point, the weather had officially turned bad. The tide was still really high, forcing us to drive in the soft sand. We were burning through fuel fast, having to give the 80 a huge amount of throttle just to get through this soft sand. Until we got to a point where I thought we might actually not be able to get through. Whoa. Creek meets ocean? <laughs> Ocean, ocean, ocean cuddles ocean, creek. Ocean fights back. <laughs> it was going to have to be doable. We just had to time it right. Whoa, whoa. That would have hit. No worries. Due to the tide, we jumped onto the Hook Point bypass track, which took us all the way down to Hook Point where we'd catch the barge. We're about to be getting on. Sorry, oh, turbo. turbo. Sorry, Turbo. Cheers, thanks, mate. How are you, buddy? Sorry, we just got handed this. It's all been standing. It's been All right, we're on the Manta Ray. This is like one of the final steps of getting up Fraser. Um, we do then need to get through Inskip Point, which is notoriously pretty boggy. Um, but that should be no worries. We've done worse on this trip, I feel like now. So yeah, basically take the barge across and then that's it. So yeah, let's do it. Let's get on to Inskip Point. Awesome, thanks mate. You too. And we're in Long Queensland. This is um that Inskip Point. This is where everyone notoriously gets bogged. So I'm just gonna give it some power, but I think we're gonna get through it. Oh god, Paddy, just easy, easy, easy. Ah. Oh, it's a little. <laughs> oh, that was easy. We're on mainland, we did it. Now, this is the most important part of the entire trip, and that is washing your car off after you've been on the island. You will get so much salt on your car, even if you don't drive with salt water, the sea spray, everything, it's going to cover it. So, it's really important to clean the car thoroughly once you get off the island. So just giving the uh, 80 a good scrubbing uh, after being in salt water for a week. Um, well, not salt water, but like, you know, around salt water. So literally, we've been off the island for maybe only like two hours, and look at the weather. Like, it's literally bucketing down again. I'm over the rain. Like, this trip has been dictated by rain, and I'm quite frankly over it, but not much we can do. We're tracking south now, and um, we'll 
find a spot to camp and um, but I am glad, I'm very we're very grateful we got the weather we did get on Fraser. Um, we really lucked out for those couple of days. We got a real, you know, gap in the weather, so we were lucky. Um, but yeah, anyway, we can deal with what's coming and just yeah, take it in our stride. After Fraser Island, Anya and I embarked on another seven days of traveling down the east coast of Australia. But that story will have to wait for another day. But thank you all so much for watching the Fraser Island videos. It's truly a spectacular place and I will definitely be coming back. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, get subscribed if you want to see more, and we'll see you guys in the next video.